Father God, I thank you for this time. Open up our hearts to receive your word. It's manna, it's bread, it's practical. It becomes part of who we are. Thank you, Lord, that your word is also seed planted deep in the good soil of our hearts. It produces a crop yielding a hundred fold return, grows us up into all that you're designed us to be and built us to be. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher. Teach us what we need to know and prepare us for what is coming in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Well, today I want to talk to you about a radical new way of thinking. When Jesus hit the ground, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He thought differently. He had a different way about him and nobody could understand it. But it was God's way, wasn't it? And the Pharisees didn't understand him, his ways. The, the people, the Jews didn't understand him. The, the Romans didn't understand him because God's ways are different than man's ways. And everybody thinks a certain way and they head down a certain way. And we can sometimes get so set in our ways that we can miss what God is trying to do in our life. And Jesus taught about this in the parable of the sower and the seed. He taught about three different people who received the seed, the word of God, into their hearts, the soil, which has the power to grow you on the inside. And yet these three individuals didn't return anything to God. They didn't grow at all. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. And so Jesus warns us to not be like one of these three. I want to talk about the first one today as I'm in the middle of a series on the parable of the sower and the seed. And this is Jesus talking in Luke chapter 8 and verse 5. He says, the sower went out to sow his seed. Remember, the seed is the word of God. And he, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Say wayside. wayside. And it was trampled down, and the birds of the air, this is Satan, devoured it, stole it. So it got planted. He heard the word of God, this guy, but it didn't produce anything. What an awful waste of the power of the word of God to have it heard. He heard it, but then nothing changed. It's the power to change, but it didn't. And, and so what, why? Well, this word, the wayside, is, is a road. It's a path. And it's the Greek word, hodos. And so they're going to put it up on the screen behind me. You can see it circled in yellow. One of the definitions is that it's a way of thinking. The way that the world thinks and the way that I think. And the way of thinking of the world, we get the idea like a hiker on a path. You ever seen a path that's beaten down so, so much that nothing grows on it? That's why it's just dirt. Or a road. We know nothing can grow on a road or a sidewalk. This is what he was talking about. It's the place where everybody's walking. Not just you, but other people too. And so you hear the word, but that's just not how you think. You hear the truth, but that's just, you're set in your ways. You've already decided. It's a person that's already decided about that subject. I've already decided. I've already seen that movie. I've already been to that rodeo. I already know how I do this. And I'm not doing it that way. That's not how I think. That's not my way. I, I'm rejecting that way, and I'm going to do it my way. And then the people that are around you also think that way. So everybody's just trampling that way because of the culture, or because of the world. See, the world was all walking and believing a certain way. But their way is different than God's way, isn't it? God's ways are higher than our ways, aren't they? But you hear the word, and then the seed happens, and then all your friends trample over it too. And then the enemy comes and steals it. And I think it's interesting that after it's been trampled and not doing anything, that Satan still comes and steals it. Do you want to know why he steals it? Because he's scared that that seed, that he knows the infinite potential that's in the word of God's seed. See, God changes us through the seed of God. He gets you into a better life by planting his word in your heart and growing you from the inside out. And Satan is scared that that word is going to do something on the inside of you. Because why? Because this is what God's up to. If he wants to change the trajectory of your future, he puts his word in there. If he wants to get a promise like healing into your life, he puts his word in there. He sent his word and it has healed them. If he wants to get you a bit of knowledge that you don't know, information that you need, he puts his word in there. If he wants to get you some wisdom so that you have the right answer, he sends his word. That Bible that you have in your hand or in your phone, that's a bag of seed. And your heart is the soil. And he says, I got a different way of thinking. And Satan's like, I got to steal that out of their heart. Because if they figure out who they really are, I'm done. Why? Because the way of thinking of the world is that you're a victim. That whatever happens to you just happens and you can't do anything about it. So the world walks around with a way of thinking that is fearful. 
and it is, I, I'm, I have no control. And what is it saying to you? It's saying you should be afraid of the flu. You should be afraid of inflation. You should be afraid of gas prices. You should be afraid of the rumors of wars. You should, you are a victim. You can't do anything about these things. What are you going to do? But then God's word comes and says, you're more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. And you got this low self-esteem. You think you're nobody. And God comes to you and says, I chose you before the creation of the world. I wrote down all of your days before one of them came to pass. I formed you in the womb. I picked you and declared you the righteousness of God. And so God talks different about you do than you talk about yourself and than the world talks about yourself. And so you have to decide, which way am I going to think? Way, there's, there's different ways to think. Which way are you going to think? So I was driving home from California and uh, on a dark desert highway, <laughs> cool wind in my, what used to be my hair. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. So, so I had my whole family with me and we hit traffic. I mean, dead traffic, nothing was moving. So there was an exit right there. Nobody was getting off the exit because there wasn't really anything to, but anyways, we got off the exit and there was a movie theater there. And so I said, let's just go see. It was middle of nowhere, but there's a movie theater. And so I said, let's just go watch a movie, two hours. We'll come back out. The traffic will probably be gone. I don't want to sit here. So we watch a movie. We come out. Traffic still hasn't moved. So we, we kind of drive to the end of this kind of access road, and, and we hit the road where you turn left and then get on the freeway. But I noticed across the street, the road that we were on kind of continued, but there were signs blocking it. And you obviously weren't supposed to go that way. But I was like, that is a road. It was kind of dirt and broken pavement, but it's old. So I said to my family, let's just take that road. And uh, <laughs> if it doesn't pan out, we can just come back. And then we'll, we'll just be waiting anyways. So everyone was like, let's do it. So off we go. Well, it wasn't long with the road kind of smoothed out. We're doing 50 miles an hour, just passing all the people. We can see them down there. They're all stuck. And we're just cruising along. A couple miles we're cruising along. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know what's going to happen. But then we hit kind of another road where you could turn left, and I could get on the freeway right there. But it still kind of went straight. There's boulders and stuff in the way. But I drove around the boulders, and we kept going. We did this three times. I don't know, probably went 15 miles down this. I think it was maybe the old highway that used to run before they built the highway and then we noticed off to the left there was the jackknife truck that was blocking all the traffic and they were trying to figure out how to get it out of the way and then there was no cars on the highway ahead of them and so we turned left and got on the freeway and off we went the rest what's my point the whole world was stuck in their way jesus said this he said i'm the way the truth and the life it's a different way and then he said also narrow is the path that leads to life, but few find it. We found the path that leads to life, somebody say amen. But we had to get out of the path that everyone else was on and decide to get on the path that was different than everyone else. And that's what I'm saying is like the whole world, just so you know, is wrong. They're wrong about everything. No, just look at like, are they right about marriage? The world, are they right about marriage? No, they're wrong. You don't wanna know how we know? Because their marriages are wrecking. They're wrong about relationships. They're wrong about God. They're wrong about church. They're wrong about being generous. They're wrong about accusations. They're wrong about forgiveness. They're wrong about bitterness. They're wrong about divisiveness. They are just wrong about everything. You ask them anything and whatever they tell you is probably wrong. The world is wrong. And so we can get so caught up into the world's ways, though, that it starts to get on us and we start to think like everyone else. And God is saying today, my ways are higher than your ways. Get on my path and you will find a different life. And not only does he teach you different things about like, you know, pray for those who persecute you. Right. Bless those who are mean to you. There's different ways of thinking. But he also gives you uh, different ways of thinking about yourself and different principles to live by. Is that right? That I might be a forgiver, that I might be a generous person, that I would be in God's house, that I might pray for others, that I might de not be about myself and my needs. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. This is, these are different ways of thinking. But they do lead you to the best life. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says it this way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So I could totally have figured it out and it seems right to me and it still has me on a train track towards destruction. That's a thought. Wait a second, I thought this through. I thought I made the right decision and it all makes sense to me and it makes sense to everybody around me, but I'm actually headed towards a train wreck. There's a way that leads to it, but it seems right to a man. And so there's, 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 
things that God wants to bring into your life to get you off those train tracks towards destruction. He's like, yeah, that doesn't work. Do it this way. And this is what God's up to today. But you know what it requires? It requires for us to take a look and say, I might be wrong. You know, in order to be right, we sometimes have to first be wrong. Maybe I don't know everything. Can I get someone to say amen? There was a man that said to me, you know, you talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, Pastor. I don't like it. And I was like, okay. And he said, you know, the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you brought it up today. It's not in the Bible. I was like, what? Who told you that? He goes, I've read the Bible twice. It's not in there. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's all over the place. So I began to share with him. It's John chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. I'm saying the Holy Spirit. And then Acts chapter 1, Jesus is like, hey, I want you to wait here for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember what John the Baptist said? I'm baptizing you with water, but Jesus is coming, and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then in Acts chapter 2, they got the Holy Spirit, but the Bible says they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues. He's like, I don't do tongues. I was like, okay, but... But Cornelius and his whole household, when they heard the message from Peter, they were all born again. And the Bible says, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they all began to speak in tongues. He was, yeah, I don't do tongues. That's weird. So then I said, okay, but what about Paul, who saw the disciples in Macedonia, and he prayed for me. He said, do you guys have the Holy Spirit? And they go, we don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And then they, he goes, well, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they go, well, we got water baptized. And John, Paul was like, I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit baptism that Jesus brought. So he lays hands on them, and they all start speaking in tongues. And the man's just looking at me, blinking. And I go, that's in the Bible. And, he, and I said, do you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He goes, no. It's weird. So what do you do with that? What, what's he dealing with? See, everybody he knows in this world has decided that those tongue-speaking speaking, speaking Christians are weird. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is weird. And so then they're all trample out the seed. And even the word of God comes and lands on the, on the path and they'll still trample it. And the enemy comes and steals it. And so we can't be so set in our ways that when the word of God comes, that we reject what God's trying to do. When Israel, come on, give the Lord some praise right now. When Israel was in Egypt and then left Egypt, they were in the wilderness for a year and three months and they got to the edge of the Jordan River and they were supposed to cross into the promised land. God's best for their life. But they didn't go, and the reason they didn't go is because they did, the giants were in the land, and we're going to kill them all, and then we're going to die. But God had said that I've given you the land, and that I'll go before you, and I'll drive out the enemy before you. God had said that, but they chose not to believe that. They chose to stick with their way of thinking, and their way of thinking was practical. Now, they'd seen all these great miracles, but it didn't matter. See, they had left Egypt, but Egypt hadn't left them. And they were stuck in their old way of thinking, and they all thought the same way. They all grumbled the same way. They all complained the same way. And so what happened was they couldn't go in. And this is how God describes it in Hebrews chapter 3. He describes it this way. He says, therefore, I was angry with that generation. Remember he told that generation? Fine, then you'll stay here for 40 years. And you guys will die in the desert. And he said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. In other words, when you know God's ways, the more ways you start to know, the more you start to advance into God's promises for your life. All of his good things, they're just some ways away from you, right? It's just the steps that you start to take is because you decided to abandon your ways and take on God's ways. Because his ways are what? Higher than my ways. Give the Lord some praise right there. Here's the problem, though. We all came out of Egypt. We did. We came out of the world. We, before you were born again, you served the world and its ways, and you thought like them, and you served the flesh, and you followed after the desires and the lusts of the flesh. That's what we all did. That's what we did. And then you got born again, and you became a new creation. And God put his, God put his Holy Spirit on the inside of you and changed everything and, and wiped away your sins in your past, praise God. But you know what? A lot of your, a lot of your thinking ways stayed with you. And the way you thought was programmed with all the lies of the world. And so what I'm saying is that when the truth of God comes, that you might get challenged. And when you get challenged in your ways, we should be like challenge accepted. Come on, somebody. I accept the challenge. I'm willing to change my ways for God's ways. When I was young, I was a very picky eater. I, I stuck to the five main food groups. Uh, cheese pizza, cheese crisp, grilled cheese, mac and cheese, 
You notice the cheese theme? Yeah. And then peanut butter and jelly. So <laughs> that's all I ate. And so all that you see in front of you was built on those five main nutritional meals. My, I, I was just a very picky eater. I didn't like a lot. I did like mashed potatoes. I love my, my stomach loves mashed potatoes. Of course, to my stomach, all potatoes are mashed. I, I believe that the onions are awful. Do you know that? Onions are, do you like onions? Yeah, no, they're awful. You don't like them. But I do like the onion ring because that is the donut of the vegetable kingdom. My mom would make Italian food every night. And just so you know, Italian food all tastes the same. Right? And there's a noodle, there's a red sauce, there's a meat, and there's a cheese. After that, it's all the same. So my mom makes spaghetti. I don't like spaghetti. And she'd be like, I made lasagna. You know what? Lasagna is nothing more than spaghetti flavored cake. It still tastes like spaghetti. So I'm on a date with my, my soon to be wife, but, but with them, we were just dating. It's my girlfriend, Kelly Collins. We went to a, the salt cellar, and, and she ordered the crab legs, and I ordered something safe steak. It's wonderful. I love my steaks. So she says, would you like some of my crab legs? No. See, I have, a, I have some strange rules about food. One of my rules about food is if it's a meat, it should not be in its original form, <laughs> like a recognizable state. Like, for instance, in Uganda, when John Orlandini and Cliff Mays and me go to Uganda, they'll, they'll order the fish. Now, I love fish, but I won't eat the fish in Uganda because when they bring it out, you know what? It, it still looks like a fish. I just want the little white, I don't want to see the fish, but they'll bring it out and the eyeballs are still <laughs> you. Eyeballs, I don't want my, if my food's looking at me, I'm not eating it, you know, it's like. <laughs> it's terrible. So, you know, we, I, I don't want, my wife, my, my girlfriend's next, you know, with these crab legs and digging the meat out of an exoskeleton and, and it's recognizable. And I'm like, we don't do that with like, if you order a burger, nobody brings you a cow leg. Like, they're like, here, here you go, you, you have to, and you break the cow leg, and then you dig the meat out and put it on a bun. Nobody does that. For some reason, when it comes to f crab, it's okay, or lobster, too. So she's digging the meat, and she's like, would you like some of this? And I was like, no, that's disgusting. You're digging, no, thank you. No, I don't want any of your crab. So she says, oh, don't be such a baby. <laughs> a baby? All right, give me the crab. So I, so she dips it in butter, and I put it in my mouth, and my palette explodes into a symphony of music. I believe that was when I was baptized in the spirit and I began to speak in other tongues. <laughs> Give me more of this wonderful heavenly food. It turns out it's my favorite food in the world still to this day is crab legs. It's the best food I've ever had in my life. And, and here's my point. I was so set in my ways that I was missing out on something better. I was so set in my thinking that I wouldn't even try something that was better than what I had. And here's the reality, I was wrong. I was wrong. And by admitting I was wrong, I was able to step into a whole new place. And what I'm saying is, is that there are things in your life that is possible that God has a better way. And that you look at the way that God brings and you say, that's not how the world thinks, that's not how I think, that's not my philosophy towards life. But God's like, yeah, I know, but it is my way and it is a better way. And if you will taste it, if you will just stop being a big baby and taste it, you will taste and see that the Lord is good. He's not trying to take all your fun away. He's trying to bring you into a deeper place into his promises. Can I get somebody to say amen in this house? We have a known issue. Do you know what a known issue is? Known issue is like something that is manufactured and the, the, you realize, the manufacturer realizes there's something wrong with what's manufactured. Well, we as humans have a lot of known issues, but, but one that I want to talk, uh, talk to you about today. My, I had a Ford Flex that had a known issue. Now, Ford wouldn't admit to it, but all the people who own the Ford Flex, would, we knew what the issue was. The door that was closed would suddenly think it was open, which is really annoying because the, you're driving on the road and it's ding, 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 like your door's open. It shows you a little picture of the door's open, but I'm like, nope, the door is closed. I clearly can see it's closed. Dome light comes on, it's dinging the whole time that you drive, and then when you park, it leaves the dome light on and your battery dies. So you got to go get this fixed pretty quick before this happens. So you go get it fixed, and then, th then that door goes bad, and then that door goes bad, then this door goes bad. Then I finally got all four fixed, and then that went bad again. And I was like, okay, I, I, I like to work on cars. I love cars. So I videotaped myself fixing the... I took off the panel. I've got all the little wires out, and I found the wire that does the door switch, and I grounded it to the, to the car, and then it thought the door was closed. <laughs> 
Always. So it always, no matter if you opened it or not, the door was closed. But that was fine. At least it didn't ding and run down my battery. So I videotaped myself doing this on YouTube, and I put it up as a Ford Flex repair for the known issue. I got 50,000 views on that. People are like, oh, thank you so much. You really saved me all this time. You helped me so much. The comments after comments after comments. And I think here's what's troubling for me. It's got more views than anything I've ever preached. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pastor. I know that you could fix, you know, help me with my marriage, but what I really need is help with my Ford Flex. Could you do another video on how to fix my car? <laughs> Known issue among humans. Now, this uh, study's been done. It's called the Dunning-Kruger Effect. It's by a man named Thomas Chamorro from Music. He's a professor of business psychology at the University College of London. And uh, I was going to explain it to you real quick. The, the digital information, this is what he says, the digital information bubble exacerbates our bias towards confirming our pre-existing beliefs instead of challenging them. Now, what he's saying is, is that when you use your device to surf the internet, computer, whatever, it actually knows already what you believe and what you think. It's learned you. And it only returns to you information that you already agree with. It won't return to you new information or things you don't agree with because it knows you don't like that. This is just the algorithm of how the internet works. And what this man was showing in his studies was that it's making us all dumber because it's causing people to no longer learn or be teachable. And what's happened as a result is that when we hear something that challenges us, because it's so foreign to us and we don't like it, it triggers us emotionally towards negativity. We get mad at it. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. That's why he said that society keeps dividing more and more because the people who believe this only see this and the people who believe this only see that so they can't even understand each other. They can't even have a conversation without hating each other. 30 years ago, you could actually talk to somebody you agree disagreed with and it all worked out fine and you could hear another person's opinion. You could grow and you could, you could have compassion and you could be challenged. It was interesting, right? We don't do that anymore. And what's happened is it's starting to invade the church. So what happens now people come to church they don't come to church to grow they come to church to see if they agree I didn't come to be challenged I came to see I came to evaluate you can't receive if you're evaluating I'm evaluating whether I agree with that person or not if I don't agree I'll go find somewhere I can go and agree with but the reality is if you only agree with everything you hear you'll never learn or grow ever you can only grow when you're challenged because somebody says something you disagree with and you might be wrong. So when I was a kid, I would sit in church and listen to my dad preach and sometimes my dad would say things I don't agree with. I was a young kid, I'm like, I don't agree with that. It was a bunch of bunk. But it was the word of God and I made a decision in my heart that if it's scripture, if it's what God's saying, that even if I don't understand it, I'm gonna do it. And I didn't always do it, because I'm not a perfect person, but I did decide to try. Whatever God said, I would do it his way instead of my own way. And I can tell you, I believe that that's what the fear of the Lord looks like. When you don't understand what God says, but you do it anyways. And you allow it to begin to change you from the inside out. And it's not always comfortable. You know, it's not always easy. So this graph I wanna show you, the Dunning-Kruger effect is, uh, it shows here confidence on one side and competence, your understanding of a subject, on the bottom. And as competence, as you get more competent about a subject, you should get more confident. But you notice there's a very first curve that goes up really fast and then comes down. That's because as soon as you learn in the hum humanity, as soon as we learn a little bit of truth, we think we're experts. So we get really confident and really loud about the little bit of truth we have. But then as you keep learning, you start to realize that you don't know anything and you eventually come down to normal so that you can actually grow. It's, it's called the curve of stupid because you're wrong, but you're so sure you're right. And I think a lot of times people get stuck on the curve of stupid. They're so, so set in believing that they're completely right and yet they're completely wrong. And so God wants to show us that he's right and we're wrong. Everything we've learned and everyone we've known while we were in Egypt is probably wrong. Probably. It's probably a lie. But when I come into God's house and I hear something that challenges my thinking, it challenges how I think or how I believe, it challenges my way, I should say to myself challenge accepted 
And then I should begin to dig around that place. I should dig on that path until it stops being a hardened path. And I should dig for the truth until I allow the Holy Spirit to germinate that word and produce life in me. Because I don't want what the world gets. You know what the world gets? Wherever they start is where they finish and they don't grow. I want to be the kind of person that where I start is not where I finished. I started here, but my God has lifted me up to a new place. David started as a shepherd boy, but God elevated him to king. Daniel started as a slave in Babylon, but God elevated him to second in command. Joseph started out as a slave in Egypt, but God elevated him. He took people from where they were, and he grew them by the power of the word of God. And if he did it for them, he can do it for us. And our job is to make sure we're not so set in our ways that we can't be teachable and learn from the truth of God. Somebody give the Lord some praise right now. Give him some joy. Thank you, Father. We receive it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I'll just leave you with this last thought. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. Say profitable. That's what we're learning today, to be profitable. I want the word to profit me for something. And people, it's not that the word doesn't work. It's that sometimes people forget to work the word. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, the entire premise and purpose of the word of God is to correct you. Which means that we have to be wrong sometimes. Can I get somebody to say amen? Father, I just thank you for this word. I ask, Lord, that you plant this deep in the good soil of our hearts. And, Lord, that we would accept the challenges when we're challenged by your word. That we would choose to believe your ways over the world's ways and our own ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we want to ask you a question of you. If you were to face eternity today, do you know what eternity looks like for you? And would you have peace with Father God? Here's the good news. God has already offered the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will believe. And you might say, believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose from the dead. If you're willing to make that decision, you can have your eternity settled today. Just pray this prayer with us. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sins. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now find a great church to get plugged into. God bless you.